Hello and welcome to the breakout room. Uh, the breakout room is sponsored by Linking Ventures. Linking Ventures is a valuations platform that tracks to your uh, bootstrapping efforts. Welcome to another episode of the breakout room where we attempt to redefine what universal truly means. Hi, my name is Cindy Guion, and I am the founder and CEO of Linking Ventures, and I've navigated the startup ecosystem for decades. Um, I started my first company when uh, in high school, sculpting ice cream, uh, frozen euphoria, freezy experience, and designed my first database actually um, under the guidance of my, my mom, who was a database guru for Auto Trader Magazine way back when. So I've got these wonderful uh, group of, of skills that combine the creative side with the um, uh, with the technical side, I've navigated a number of startups uh, in technology, usually um, from anything from ed tech to uh, creative tech to design tech to fintech to clean tech, a little bit of everything. Now, what we're trying to explore in the breakout room is redefining universal. So universal right now really kind of takes one type of person and wraps all of the research and wraps all of the uh, design um, and governance around, around one person. So when we talk about, and I like to use this as an analogy because it really hits home very quickly. We talk about, um, uh, I was member, I was a, 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 a ski patroller for, a volunteer ski patroller for a number of years, with, uh, the Canadian ski patrol system. And we, and I also taught it. And we taught that the universal signs, the universal signs and symptoms of a heart attack were the crushing sensation in the chest and the radiation of pain up and down the left arm. That does not apply to women. We know this because the research that has been done shows that heart attacks in women actually happen at the microvascular level. So what does that mean for the technology? It means that the cardio technology that is meant to capture heart attacks is unable to, to, to detect uh, uh, heart attacks or, or has a tough time detecting heart attacks in women. This needs to change. The research is either being done and then thrown away or not done at all. Another example would be in design from a design aspect would be cars and seat belts and for women out there, uh, when you next time you get into your car, find out where it sits. That seatbelt sits on your neck. Does it feel like it's cutting off a little bit? And then, and on your pelvis, the seatbelt is actually designed to hold your pelvis in place in the seat. Because women's pelvises are structured very differently, even down to the caustic as curves in the whole pelvic system is 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 different so therefore with the seat belt as opposed to sitting on the bone of the pelvis which is what it was designed to do it slips over top of the pelvis so even with a survivable accident in a car women are more like likely to have life altering um life altering uh, um uh, accidents or, or life altering uh, um, consequences or even death. All of that to be said, it's not about defining a universal system. Um, my daughter's, uh, my daughter brought me when she was in grade three, she brought me this wonderful picture that really helped to explain to me what the difference between equality and equity was. And it was an amazing picture. And she was so excited about having learned what the difference between equality and equity was. And it was these three boxes and uh, a fence. And on the other side of the fence was a game. And the man was able to stand up on the box and see perfectly over top of the, uh, over top of the fence. The woman was able to stand up on the box, but was unable to see over the fence. And the person with the wheelchair was unable to even get up on the box. So it's not about equality. It's about equitab equitability. So it's not about have, giving, giving underrepresented people uh, a seat at the table. It's about redesigning that table and ergonomically creating a chair that is universal that fits to a number of different people or designing different chairs. So what do you need to be able to recreate that? 
So that's what I mean about redefining universal. And now let's take a step back and figure out, well, who's responsible for it? Or better yet, who is the most interested in something like this? Who can be, how can this, how can we bring this about? What, what can we do to create an evolutionary um, milestone in what, how we redefine universal? I like to kind of use this as a little bit of a, a story. If we try to affect change from a government level, well, if we do get through the right channels and we do get the ear, it happens too slowly really to affect change. If we try to affect change from the corporate level, it has to be monetized very quickly. If we try to affect change from whatever underrepresented group we are, <laughs> well, we've seen how that can end and it's not usually positive. So who has the most impact on change? And who is the closest to the beginning of that change? Well, startups are. Startups are the greatest influence to change. And they captivate the attention of our earliest adapters. So just by simply changing how startups start, we can affect change on a mass level to the point where people will look back and go, well, I thought we were always doing it this way anyways. So how do we change how startups start? Simply by, and I had this wonderful opportunity to do a survey on what started as 50, it's now 150 um, startup founders. And I asked them to walk me through the different personas of, of, their, of their product, of their service. And they would automatically have this go-to um, of, uh, uh, you know, they'd walk me through the product. And, and then I asked them, well, now can you tell me how a woman would navigate through your service or product? And they took me through it and they went, oh, I just, I can just tweak this or, oh, I can just add this. And all of a sudden they've opened up their product to all this extra revenue just by a few tweaks at an early stage startup. And can you imagine the impact that we can have if just by the power of suggestion at the earliest stages, we're able to open up accessibility to all these different types of people that will be using your product or service. Now, bias amplification is also an effect that can happen at the startup stage. So if you've got this wonderful algorithm algorithm or AI that you've been working on that accidentally builds in bias because innately that's what happens unless you're actually very cognizant of what's happening. And that growth of that bias, the amplification of it can be extraordinary. And which is one of the things that we have to be very cognizant of with open AI, open AI right? Chat GPT. How do we avoid these areas? And, I, and I'd like to suggest that the best way to do this is by, again, analogy of not just giving somebody a seat at the table, but ergonomically and biologically designing that table to accommodate different voices and having their influence in your product design. So how does that table look? And how many voices do you get there? And how do you get those voices to the table? So having a strong understanding of the startup level of the different elements of your design and governance practices. Universal also should go beyond just the people and into, well, let's say the environment as well. We should be designing for the environmental impact with all of our products. We don't think about it, but something as simple as this streaming video takes up enough energy to, to power a small country. We don't think about that. So as a SaaS company or a technology company, we don't consider the data and where that's being stored. So asking things like, what type of energy is being used to power the data center that houses my SaaS platform, as an example, would be a great place to also consider. 
all of these components can be addressed at the earliest stages because startups are so malleable. And if you create something that has a true need that you're addressing, and you have that wonderful first followership of all these people that are so keen on getting into your product, they adapt to what you're doing and so forth and so on. And that is how you can amplify this unbiased change, this change that literally has a massive and amplified effect for positive. I want to encourage you all to take a look at, as a founder, how you're addressing your unbiased um, actions and how you're building in accessibility into your design. Um, please reach out to me. I have a, a, a process that uh, that I can help to um, uh, to um, to help you guys think differently. Um, and from a governance standpoint, how to uh, I, I'd love for for somebody to reach out to me to give the to to give me uh, uh, an idea on how to find people that have these different voices to sit um, on a board or an advisory board because that's where we really need to to start playing. Um, this, how we start to, to build this movement on creating change, uh, on changing how startups, uh, changing how startups start. Everything that we do at the startup level has the power to have an impact just because of the voices of the people that come on board at the very early, at the very early stages. My uh, primary area of study is in first followership, specifically in startups. And I, I often bring in uh, my, it was actually triggered, the, the whole area of first followership was actually triggered by um, a video in my master's program that we were, we were told to watch um, by Derek Seavers. And it had this one lone dancer, and I would encourage you to, to find it, but it's Derek Seavers and followers, uh, first follower. And it had this one lone dancer in a Woodstock type field, uh, probably at a music concert of some sort. And uh, he was just dancing, obviously inebriated, but having the time of his life. And he looked the fool until a stranger jumped out of the audience and started dancing along with him. So it, it validated the idea. And this is what we have in that startup community, right? You have that amazing idea. You're solving that amazing need. And someone jumps out of the crowd and follows you, that crazy person, that founder, and validates your idea. Now you've got somebody who says, yeah, no, this is cool. And I've actually likened that, um, that, that first follower to somebody like um, Steve Jobs, right? So Steve Wozniak would be that 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 fool dancing off in the uh, um, in the field with his brilliant idea and his crazy idea, and then that first follower comes along and amplifies um, this amazing idea, and then all of a sudden you get this ring around that second follow that first follower. And they start to talk about the a massive need for what to, what's going on here. And you can actually see the how change happens in the same way that startups build, right? And then you have those investors that come on in or that non-diluted grant that uh, that you're able to get. And all of these validating components are adding through this this followership sequence, right? And this is how you build a movement. And this is how you drive change, right? So moving with that first followership and that followership sequence, this is how we affect change. This is how we move. Now, startups are dynamic and we like to talk about failing upwards. And I recently heard a quote on one of my favorite podcasts, which is uh, The Full Ratchet with Nick Moran. And uh, I'll have to leave in the show notes the uh, um, the investor who had said this, um, but he's referencing another investor, sorry. And it was about, about making mistakes and how we learn to make mistakes. And I, and I really had to unpack this because it was a very different way of looking at mistakes. And we always talk about failing upwards, but uh, this gentleman had said, if you, if, you, if you keep learning from your mistakes, you'll never invest in any companies at all. Now, what does that mean 
in terms of startups and mistakes and failing upwards and change. Well, it means that you have to allow yourself the ability to learn from your mistakes in a way that allows you to pivot slightly to create variances, unless you fail fast, which is good, right? But what do you learn from that? So don't, don't unpack everything too much because you'll learn, you'll lose your momentum. What are the little modifications you can create for all of you developers or, or, or tech types out there understanding that, um, uh, that agile type of methodology where you're constantly deploying something um, while you're, you've got something alive uh, um, uh, and out there. So how do you keep on um, uh, moving forward without fully grasping, you know, I've made a mistake and failing downwards. How do you fail upwards? Um, it's about learning from the components of your mistake, but still being curious enough to keep moving forward with your idea and just adapting to what your traction is giving back to you. Because if you're not getting any traction at all, fail fast. If you are getting some traction, learn from the little mistakes, learn from them. Um, one of my new favorite uh, uh, books is uh, The Mom Test, which I would encourage anybody to uh, to grab onto. Um, but it's about learning how to ask the right questions so that you're able to, to move on. I am so excited about all of the aspects of first followership and how it can actually harness um, that startup creativity, that startup think different, that startup innovation and how it can change everything we do. All of these little iteration uh, components, as I mentioned, our primary sponsor is Linking Ventures are captured at the earliest stages of a startup. Valuation shouldn't be a one-time, here's what we're doing, <laughs> offering to an investor when you desperately need money. It should be a living, breathing reflection of what you're doing and what you're learning and how you're making mistakes and pivoting and everything that goes along with the discovery and the um, excitement of being a founder. And this is what the Linking Ventures platform does. Oh, well, in conclusion, I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of the Breakout Room. In future, we will have uh, guests and explore how to unpack and how to redefine universal to mean something much more inclusive, but much more creative, looking at it from different tables. Again, about giving a seat at the table that has been ergonomically designed for each of the different personas that can sit around it. At the end of all these things, I like to talk about how when I was a young child, I lived very close to my uh, my school. So on the way home, um, I was running after my friend, Hilda, 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 and I got up super close and realized it wasn't her. So I just kept running around the corner yelling her name. So for all of you founders that feel a little bit, a little bit lost, don't worry about the little mistakes you're making. Just keep running and waving. It will catch up to you again. Thank you and have an absolutely amazing day.